Mr. Nunnery, that conversation was in July of 2003. Yes. When were you arrested for this offense? November of 2003. Where were you arrested? At the apartment on Spalding. The one you discussed previously? Yes. And when I said this offense, I was referring to the murder of Mr. Rangel, correct? Yes. And on the day of your arrest, did law enforcement officers interview you? Yes. Chicago police officers? Yes. And did they take a statement from you? Yes. And did they then record the statement? Yes. And what did you tell them? I told them that I ain't have nothing to do with the murder and subsequently told them that I was planning an armed robbery. You told them that you were planning an armed robbery of who? Cato. And was that true? No. So you lied to the Chicago police officers? Yes. Why did you lie to them? Because I didn't want to get charged with the murder. So you thought if you admitted to a robbery that it would be a lesser offense or something like that? Yes. And this was all on the day of your arrest in 2003? Yes. Now you testified earlier about how you went to trial. Yes. Correct? Yes. And then who was charged with you again for the murder of Mr. Rangel? Labar, Black, and Squeaky. And you went to trial alone? Yes. And when was your trial? August of 2007. And you testified at your trial, correct, Mr. Nunnery? Yes. And did you lie on the witness stand? Yes. What did you say? I said that the police beat me and made threats to my family and things like that. So you said that the officers beat you up? Yeah. When were you claiming the officers beat you up? During my interrogation. Why? Why were you making the claim that the officers beat you up during your interrogation? To discredit my statement. Why did you want to discredit your statement? Because it could possibly aid in my conviction. So you thought it would hurt you? Yeah. So you took the witness stand? Yes. In your state case? Yes. You raised your right hand? Yes. And then you lied? Yes. And you understand what that means? Yes. You committed perjury? Yes. Did any police officer hit you in relation to your interview? No. And you testified about some drugs in the house? Yes. Did law enforcement find some drugs or drug items in your house? Yes. And did law enforcement officers tell you that someone could be charged with that? Yes, they told me that my girl and my mother. Was that true? Yes. And you told that on the witness stand? Yes. So that part was true? Yes. But to be clear, again, no officer ever laid his hands on you. No. During your interrogation? No. And you were convicted? Yes. Mr. Nunnery, I asked you questions earlier about basically why you're here and why you're testifying, and I asked you whether or not you understood that I don't control your sentence. Do you understand that? Yes. Judge Durkin doesn't control your sentence? Yes, I understand. The judge in Cook County does. Right. 
and you're hoping that judge considers your testimony here today and reduces your sentence. Yes. But you don't know if he or she will. No. Do you know if Mr. Spann was convicted in state court of the murder of Rudy Rangel? No, he wasn't. Are you testifying today because you have some sort of vendetta against Mr. Spann because you were convicted and he wasn't? No. Why not? Because I'm the reason why he wasn't convicted. What do you mean? What do you mean that you are the reason he wasn't convicted? I refused to testify him in the first trial. Somebody, who asked you to testify against Mr. Spann? The state's attorney in our first trial. Well, my first trial. They asked you to cooperate? Yes. And what did you say? I told them no. They offered me 20 years at 85%. Objection, Your Honor. Hang on, hang on. There's no question pending, Judge, and at this point, the relevance to the deal. All right, why don't you ask your next question? The last answer is stricken. And your next question, if there's an objection to it, I'll hear it at that time. Okay, I think I asked you, you said you were the reason Mr. Spann was acquitted. I asked you what you meant by that. And you said that the state's attorney's office asked you to cooperate against him and you refused. Yes. Okay. Then you started talking about a deal. Those were the next words coming out of your mouth? Yes. So did the, so did the state's attorney's office offer you some sort of deal in exchange for your testimony? Yes. What did they offer you? They offered me 20 years at 85%. And for you to get that deal, what did you have to do? Testify against Mr. Spann. And did you agree? No. And is that what you mean by you were the reason he was acquitted? Yes. Now, after you were arrested for the murder of Mr. Rangel, were you detained pending trial? Yes. And where were you held? In Division 9 at Cook County Jail. Can you explain what's Division 9? It's a maximum security division. Is Cook County Jail divided up into different divisions? Yeah, yeah, one, I believe, through 11. Was Mr. Spann in the same division as you? No, he was in Division 8, the medical part of the jail. So did you ever see Mr. Spann while you were in custody? Yes. When would you see him and where? At our court dates in the bullpen. What is the bullpen? Like a cage that they hold you in until you go into the courtroom. So it's a room that the officers, the sheriffs bring you in before court? Yes. How big is this bullpen? Maybe 10 feet by 15 feet or so. Okay, not big like this courtroom. No, no. And you referred to it as a cage. Is it like a cell, a prison cell? Yes. And you said you would see Mr. Spann in the bullpen? Yes. How often would you see Mr. Spann in the bullpen? Maybe monthly. How often did you have court dates? Probably every month or every other month. How long would you be in the bullpen before your case was called? Hours. Multiple hours? Yes. Who was in the bullpen with you before these court dates? It would be me, Broman, Black, and Fufop, 
Squeaky was in the bullpen next door to us. And Mr. Nunnery, I'm going to remind you to lean in a little bit. You got a little softer. Yeah, Squeaky was in the bullpen next door to us. What was your understanding of why Squeaky was next door? He was in protective custody. And what did you understand that to mean? He wasn't in regular population. Do you know why he was there? He said that the Cook County Sheriff put him there because his life might have been in danger by the Latin Kings. And you referred to yourself and Mr. Span. Black, that's Mr. Coleman? Yes. And Fufop? Yeah. Now, was Fufop charged with the murder of Mr. Rangel? No. So what is your understanding of why he was there? Because him and Broman was charged with an armed robbery, a separate case, but in front of the same judge. So you said Squeaky was next door? Yeah, in the bullpen next to us. Could you talk to Squeaky? Yes. Could you hear him? Yeah. Could he hear you? Yeah. Could you see him? No. At a certain point, did Mr. Coleman stop coming to court? Yes. What did you take that to mean? That he took a deal. What do you mean by that? That he got a deal from the state's attorney for his cooperation. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Nunnery. We're in the bullpen, and you said Mr. Coleman stopped coming at one point. When you were in these bullpen meetings with Mr. Span, Mr. Coleman, Foo Fop, and Squeaky Next Door, what did you all discuss? We just discussed the witnesses in the case and just different things, what was going on. What did you discuss about the witnesses? Just whether or not we can get in contact with them to make sure they don't come to court. What do you mean, make sure they don't come to court? Make sure that they don't testify in court. Did you learn who the witnesses were? Yes. How? Originally from Mr. Span. And did you all make some sort of agreement with respect to the witnesses? Yes. What did you agree to do? That he would get, he would try to get in contact with Kirk, the guy on the street. And I would talk to the guys that was locked up where I was locked up at in Division 9. Okay, so you said he would talk to Kirk? Who is he? Broman, he said he would send some of his guys to go talk to Kirk. And who's Kirk? The barber that was cutting Cato's hair at the time that he was killed. So Mr. Span, so Mr. Span indicated he would send some guys to talk to Kirk? Yeah. And then who were you taking responsibility for in terms of the witnesses? Laval and Chardal Green. Who are Laval and Chardal? They were supposed to be eyewitnesses to the case. They brothers. Supposed to be at the barbershop? Yeah. And the agreement was you would take responsibility for them? Yes. And you said something about custody. Why did you have responsibility for Laval and Chardal? Because they were in Division 9 where I was. Did you know if Laval and Chardel had nicknames? Yeah. What were they? Laval's nickname was Moon and Chardel's nickname was Bull. And were these two brothers? Yes. Were they older or younger than you? Younger. Younger? Yeah. Did you associate Laval or Moon with a gang? Yes. 
Which gang? Traveling Vice Lord. And how about Shardaller Bull? Yeah, Traveling Vice Lord. So they were both TVLs? Yes. And you had these conversations in the bullpen? Yes. Did you have any conversations in the bullpen about Squeaky getting paid? Yeah, me and Broman discussed the money that I paid him. And what did you say to him and him to you? I forgot how it came up in conversation. I don't recall how it came up in conversation, but we discussed me giving him the 15000 or whatever. And go ahead. And Squeaky found out how much he had got and he was mad about it. Why was Squeaky mad based on your understanding? Because he didn't get paid. Did Squeaky make statements indicating he didn't get paid? Yes. Now, you also testified that at a certain point, Mr. Coleman stopped coming to court. Yes. And you understood he was either cooperating or talking to law enforcement. Yes. Did you and Mr. Spann have a conversation about Mr. Coleman once he stopped coming to court? Yes. And what did you discuss? Him not testifying and Broman was trying to find out where his mother stayed to try to have somebody to go talk to her to tell her to tell him not to come to court. Do you know if this was successful? No. No, you don't know? No, I don't know. So you testified that you had the responsibility to talk to Shardell and Laval. Yes. And you understood they were witnesses? Yes. Let's talk about Shardell first. Did you encounter Shardell in Cook County Jail? Yes. And what did you say to him? I introduced myself, told him who I was, and, you know, asked him was he a witness on the case, and he told me, yeah. Did you ask him anything else? Yeah, I asked him would he be willing to do an affidavit for me and come to court and say Squeaky wasn't the person that he saw shooting. And what did he say? He told me, yeah. And based on your understanding, did he do that? No, my lawyer never called Chardell to court. And just to be clear, you asked Chardell to do something and say something that was not true? Yes. And then did you meet with Laval? Yes. Where did you meet with Laval? I originally saw him in a hallway where he was a worker cleaning the hallway and I approached him, introduced myself to him and asked him the same thing. Would he be willing to do an affidavit for me and come to court and say that Squeaky wasn't the shooter? And when you say a hallway, you're referring to the hallway where? In Division 9. In the Cook County Jail? Yeah, in Cook County Jail. So you had this conversation with Lavelle in the hallway? Yeah, a brief conversation. I told him when he agreed that he would be willing to help me, I told him I would set up a visit for us so we could would all have a longer time to talk. A visit where? In the jail, Cook County Jail. And did you do that? Yes. Explain what you did. I had somebody that was coming to see me to bring someone with them so that they can call Laval out so that me and Laval will be in the visiting room together. And did that happen? Yes. Do you remember who you had come visit you? No, I don't, but I believe it was a girl named Shamika. So a woman you knew? Yeah. And did this meeting occur? Yes. So where were you and where was Laval? 
me and Lavelle, we were in the visiting room on one side of the glass and the visits were on the other side of the glass. Did you and Lavelle have the opportunity to speak there? Yes. And what did you say to him? I explained to him that I needed him to do an affidavit and come to court and explain that Squeaky wasn't the person that he saw shooting. And was that true? Was what true? Were you asking Lavelle to lie? Yeah. And why were you doing that? To help us beat the case. Now, I apologize. I don't know if I asked you this earlier. You were how old in 2003 and 2004? 26 and 27. And do you know how old Lavelle was? 19... No, he was 19 in 2007, so about 17. So he was about 10 years younger than you? Yeah. Did Lavelle push back at all, or did he agree to sign this affidavit? No, he didn't push back. He agreed. Now, when you were doing these things, would you, Mr. Spann, Squeaky, and Mr. Coleman, when he was there... Would you have meetings to update each other back in the bolt pen? Yes. Now, Mr. Nunnery, you testified that you went to trial and you were convicted. Yes. Despite these efforts to obstruct, you were convicted. Yes. And did you file something called a post-conviction petition? Yes. What is that? It's a petition asking for reconsideration after you've been convicted. So it's like another attempt to challenge your conviction? Yes. So you filed a document like that? Yes. And when you did, did you ask Chardell and Lavelle to draft affidavits again? Yes. And to make statements that were false? Yes. At a certain point, Mr. Nunnery, did you withdraw that post-conviction petition? Yes. Did you do so and agree to cooperate with the government? Yes. Yes. Just one more or two questions. Mr. Nunnery, you testified that when you would make these efforts with respect to the witnesses, yes. This is what you were doing with respect to Laval and Chardell? Yes. Would Mr. Spann update you on his efforts with respect to Kirk? Yes. And would you all update each other about the progress? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Nunnery. Thank you, Your Honor. That's all I have. All right. Cross-examination. 